Hey guys, my name's Joe, also known as Joey, also known as Axelkin2001. You may recognize me from... And, uh... Or... I got something for Diabetics. It's called a knuckle sandwich. <laughs> I love Kingdom Hearts, the video game that was released on uh, many consoles. So when I heard about the now infamous leak saying that Very Sexy Gaming was going to be tackling Kingdom Hearts, I was jumping for joy. Being a master at the deep and meaningful lore of the series, I requested to make .mp4 files explaining the games that Josh and Luke were skipping. They said no. If I'm correct, this video will be seen after they're done with Kingdom Hearts 1. There's some post-game content that these idiots may or may not have done. I wrote this script when they were starting Infinite Fusion, so I'm gonna have to take a shot in the dark and pretend like they haven't. Which is a shame, because there's a lot of good boss fights you could do. Like Kurt Zisa, a giant heartless named after a PlayStation magazine winner. Or The Phantom, which is the worst thing in the entire world because your teammates get permadeath during the fight. Or the man himself, Sephiroth, who was voiced by uh, Lance Bass of NSYNC. Time to end. Dodge this! Meet your fate! Rawr. Over here. <laughs> Come, power! Matches perfectly with his character. Boring. Seriously, no one cares about Sephiroth. In case you're wondering if this is an ironic statement, uh, no, I recorded this before Sephiroth was announced for Smash, I don't know yet. But the one I want to bring the most attention to is this hooded fellow over here. His name is unknown, and he's simply labeled in the game as Enigmatic Man. He doesn't even have a voice, just disembodied text. He says some interesting stuff, though. Wait, what are you- Well, I know who isn't invited to my birthday party. After you beat this mysterious gentleman, he's all like, I've been to see you. You look a lot like him. But Sora's too busy using reused voice clips to question that. What's that supposed to mean? What's that supposed to mean? He teleports away. So at this point, you know everything there is to know. Sora and Donald are following Pluto to find Riku and King Mikey. <sighs> Now's the part where I start filling you in. Okay, so here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna have to do two videos. One for these next two games, and another for more games that come after the second. Likelihood is, this will be the shorter of the two videos. Even though shit's about to start going crazy around this point, it doesn't start going crazy crazy until Birth by Sleep, which I'll be covering after you beat Kingdom Hearts 2. What we'll be going over first in today's lesson is Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. It was a Game Boy Advance game released in 2004. This rant has been done to death, so I'll make this quick. Imagine really liking the first game back in 2002, and really wanting to see what would come from that cliffhanger ending. And then your quote-unquote answers are given to you on a console you don't own. Thankfully, the game was remade on the PS2 in 2007, under the title Kingdom Hearts Rechain of Memories. Our wonderful adventure begins right where Kingdom Hearts 1 left off with Sora and gang chasing after Pluto. After giving chase for like, 10 minutes, they decide they've had enough for the day and go to bed. In the middle of the night, Sora goes out to take a tinkle, when a strange man in a black coat starts saying some dumb shit about Along the road ahead lies something you need. However, in order to claim it, you must lose something that is dear to you. I don't know about this black coat guy, but he's nowhere near as cool as the one from the first game, am I right, fellas? After walking down the path some more, they find a big-ass castle in the middle of nowhere. For some reason, the three of them think that Riku and Mickey are in this castle, so they have to go in. Well, to be fair, they did say they had a feeling they'd be here. Something just told me he'd be here, okay? Really? Cause now that you mention it, I was kinda thinking the same thing. Seriously? Me too. What the fuck? Okay, so the original game didn't have voice dialogue, so they had to make these voiced cutscenes in 2007, five years after Kingdom Hearts 1. Haley Joel Osment went through this thing that shitty adults call puberty, and now he sounds like a grown-ass man despite Sora being the same age as he was in the first game. Jiminy comes out of Sora's snatch to say, hey, maybe this is a bit suspicious actually, we all think the same stuff at the same time. But Sora threatens his life, so he goes back. Suddenly, the black coat man comes back. For some reason, Donald, for the first time in his entire life, feels the need to announce that he's about to use magic. He's about to Zeta Flare this bitch, but uh-oh, he can't. Black coat man basically says, 
You idiots. The second you walked in here, this became a challenge run. Now you're all at level one. He goes on to say, In this place, to find is to lose, and to lose is to find. That is the way in Castle Oblivion. What an edgy name. He says that they're going to be seeing people that they've met in the past, except they won't remember them. Then he says that Riku's here, and at this point, I'm already bored. He gives Sora a card that has a picture of Traverse Town on it, and he's like, My dad gave me that? I'm only letting you borrow it because you gave me your Hot Wheels at recess last week. They go through the door and now they're in Traverse Town again. Black Coat Man once again appears behind Sora and says, Yo, check it out. This is Traverse Town, but it isn't. It's not real, it's a fake. This is actually a custom VR chat room I made, do you like it? They're about to exchange Discord IDs when Jiminy comes out and he's like, Uh, hello, Donald and Goofy are gone. Black Coat Boy's like, I turned them into cards. They have NFC functionality. If you use them in Breath of the Wild, you get some fish. And then the first battle begins. Okay, so like, I haven't played this game in a while because it sucks and I don't remember the combat system too well, I'm not gonna waste time looking it up, so I'm just gonna go off what I remember. This is not even remotely similar to the first game, it doesn't function the same. Everything you do outside of running and jumping is determined by cards. You use cards to do spells, you use cards to do summons, you use cards to use Donald and Goofy, you use cards to swing the fucking Keyblade. Every enemy also has cards that they use to do certain attacks against you. Every card has a number attached to it, 1 to 9. If you use a card that's a higher number than your opponent's, then your move will have a higher priority against theirs. If it's lower, they have priority against you. There are also cards that have zeros on them, which is the highest priority of all. There's a meter in your deck that you can use to refill the cards you used, but you won't get to use the same ones every refill, okay? After that nightmare, Black Coat Man leaves, and the real adventure can truly begin. They dick around for a bit, and then they see Leon. He's back, baby. But he doesn't seem to remember the three, because that's not even the real Leon at all. He's not back, baby. No one remembers our heroes, so they basically just gotta do all the worlds again, but with a shittier combat system this time. The enemies are all the same ones that you've come to know and love from the first game. We have the Crawler, the Scrounger, the Flat Earther, Xehanort, YouTuber Peanut Butter Gamer, etc. They get the heck out of there and are met by guess who? Well, Sora, did you enjoy meeting your memories? Yeah, it was good to see everyone. Coat starts walking ominously towards Sora, but is interrupted by everyone's favorite guy. Hello! Oh, my name's Axel. Got it memorized. I don't know if we're playing MGS2 by this point, but he's voiced by Raiden, if you couldn't tell. He says he wants to fight the Keyblade Master, and if Coat Man stops him, then he's telling Mom on him. Axel's the first boss of the game, so the fight is on. <laughs> The fight is over. Axel's all like, congratulations on defeating me. Here, have this card and me ominously telling you that you're forgetting someone who's more important to you than Riku. Castle Obliv- 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 They move on, but it seems like they forgot about Hollow Bastion for whatever reason. Holo- Holy? Holler? So they start going through the Disney worlds. I'm not going to explain what happens in all of them. I'd rather die. It's basically the same plot as the original games, but everyone forgot Sora or whatever. In between each Disney World, they talk more about stuff that they're forgetting. Could it be that we don't remember because we're losing our memories? Because I guess they aren't complete dum-dums. They realize that the further they go into the castle, the more memories they'll lose. As they keep going on, they keep talking about how they'd never forget their friends. So, obviously, they're going to completely forget about their friends by the end of this. Cut to a scene of Axel with a different member of the Black Coat Brotherhood, Lark Scene. She's picking on Axel for being interested in a little boy. He says that the only reason he is is because he became a Heartless and was still able to retain his feelings, which only one other person was able to do. Sora and crew are talking about forgetting stuff or whatever, it's topical. And Sora pulls out the lucky charm that Kairi gave him to show that he'd never forget about her. And he's immediately distracted from this thought by suddenly remembering someone else. A different girl, with blonde hair. It seems that the more Sora forgets, the more he remembers. And what I find funny is that as soon as he starts thinking about her, it almost seems like he doesn't care about finding Riku anymore. You're slowly drip-fed more information about this girl as the game goes on. It's honestly pretty frustrating, especially because the Disney worlds are among the worst to play in the series. Another scene with Axel and Larxene. Larxene says she's gonna fight Sora next because, eh, why not? Don't forget, Sora is the key. We need him if we're going to take over the organization. Take over the organization? Ooh, like a coup d'etat? Count me in. So she goes to Sora, says that the girl he's trying to remember is in this castle being held captive. Then she beats him up and he drops a different lucky charm. 
that isn't Kairi's. It must be the other girls, eh, Luigi? Marxine is like verbally coaxing him into remembering her name, and it somehow works? Na. Na. Me. Name. Namine. Then he gets mad and beats Larxene up. Then she runs away, and for some reason Sora's so mad he goes into a fit. Where are you? Don't you dare hide from me! Show yourself! Back at Koopa's castle, Larxene comes back to Axel like... Whew. Throwing that battle wore me out. Really? It looked to me like you just plain lost. How dare you! So then a new guy shows up, Vexen. Vexen is a scientist man, that's his character. I'm a scientist. Experiments are what I do. Yes. He says that he's gonna show Sora the power of his new experiment, and then Columbia will rue the day they rejected his application. Whew. Sora sure does seem like he's upset. You'd be too. He just remembered a friend, but found out she's in trouble. I don't know, I just think this scene's funny. After dicking around in Atlantica, except they're not fish this time, they find Riku. He's just chillin' on the 36th floor of Castle Oblivion. So he starts, like, immediately being an asshole. He's like, you've changed, man. You used to only care about me. Now you, like, care about multiple people. How could you do this? Namine doesn't even like you anymore. He starts talking about how it's Sora's fault Namine left the island in the first place, and then Riku turns into a shadow man, like he did in the first game. Remember? When he, remember when he did that? In the first game? He starts attacking because he's the only one that could protect Namine. After getting a good whacking... My beautiful gun is destroyed! <laughs> good thing I got a spare upstairs. Sora's a bit confused by the situation, and Jiminy comes in with the voice of reason. Hmm... Sure was strange. Almost like Ansem was back, controlling Rico again. But we got rid of Ansem for good. <laughs> they hypothesize that Riku just forgot that he's Sora's friend because they're in Castle Oblivion, and they move on. So after three Disney worlds with zero plot progression, Vexen finally comes in to disappoint his parents. He says he's the reason Riku's here. They fight, he loses, he gives you a card, he leaves, moving on. Another scene in Koopa's castle, this time with the new guy. Pink hair boy tells Axel to kill Vexen because his fight was underwhelming at best, and also because he's a traitor or something. Welcome to Twilight Town. No, not that Twilight Town, silly. The worst one. They go through the town, seeing the beautiful sights, until they make it to a mansion that's somewhat out of the way. Sora says that this place is familiar to him as well, but it feels different than it does with remembering Namine. This one feels... realer. And then Vexen pops back up for round two, baby. But first he says that the memories of this place lie on the other side of Sora's heart. Whatever the fuck that means. Just a slave to twisted memories. Yes. Exactly like my Riku. Like your... Riku? Worth nothing? Don't talk about him. Like you own him! Especially in front of me! Sora beats the shit out of Vexen with the help of the Nine Tails' power. Vexen's all like, If you continue to seek the girl Namine, the shackles will tighten. You'll lose your heart and end up becoming Marluxia's pawn! But then Axel comes in and silences him. No! Please don't! I don't want to- Goodbye. Also, quick note, Pink Hair Boy is Marluxia, and he's the hooded guy from the beginning. They start talking about that coup from earlier, and say that Namine is the key factor in all of it, saying that the memories of Sora for Namine are less than real. Sora is encountered by Riku once again, and goes off on basically the same exact tangent. Oh, you don't like her, I do. Here's a charm she made me. But it turns out Namine was a real homewrecker, because Sora also has that same exact charm. That gives Riku a rare moment of clarity before snapping back into murder mode. You're the fake. Sora is now entering the realm of being an asshole. 
He's yelling at Donald, berating Goofy, he just straight up ate Jiminy, it's a bad time for everyone. So he runs ahead into Destiny Islands, the final world. Axel tells Namine that she could escape if she wants, because no one around currently is gonna stop her. So she escapes into the castle. On Destiny Islands, Sora meets up with Waka, Selfie, and Tidus. Get a good look, because I'm pretty sure this is the last time we're seeing them, and they're not even real here. He struggles to remember their names, which at first I thought was a joke referencing their insignificance to the story, but it's because of Castle Oblivion. After kissing Apparition Riku for a little bit, the island starts to act a little funny. Uh-oh, looks like Darkseid's back at it again. Gonna have to take him out again, just like old times. After you're done with that, Namine goes to see you and is like, Look, you only like me because I made you like me. Truth is, I'm very insecure. I mean, take a look at that ghost of me over there. It's symbolic. That lucky charm you're holding isn't even mine, you idiot. It's Kyrie's, you dumbo. Sora wasn't really listening, but while he was being swallowed into the eye of the hurricane, he basically had this realization by himself. So he catches up with Namine and asks, Hey, so, who's that bitch that I actually like? I forgot her name, could you help me out? But before she can answer, Riku comes back in just to remind Sora that he's still here and still hates him. Back up! Riku! Want some more? No, Riku, I don't. We both had a long day today, and I think we're letting our hormones get in the way of what's really important. I realized, I don't think I really like Namine that much after all. I know, after all that, right? <laughs> you can be her protector. You're more worthy than I am of the task. What do you say we get out of this castle and just hang out for a little- ah! Sora! Riku's about to finish this series off for good, but then- I said stop! The weight of Sora's speech hit him right there and he couldn't find a will to fight anymore. And by that I mean he died. Larkseen comes in and kicks Sora for no good reason. And then she tells him that the Riku that just died there isn't actually Riku, but a replica created by the late Dr. Vexen. It was implanted with fake memories by Namine. You see, Namine has the power to alter people's memories. That's how Sora got all those pleasant times in his head. Larkseen is quite unhappy with how their plans were foiled by Axel for letting Namine free. So now she has to kill Sora. Oh no! Namine gets in the way, so Larkseen slaps her next to the dead clone Riku. This makes Sora give a speech about how even if the memories are fake, the promise he made to protect her was real to him. She's about to finish this series off for good, but then the weight of Sora's speech hit her right there and staggered her for enough time that Donald and Goofy were able to catch up and help him out. With the power of friendship and dead replicas, the three half-pints take down Larkseen and she fucking dies. No. No. I refuse to lose. To such a bunch of losers! Namine explains in more detail how this memory shit works. She can basically take people's memories and add, remove, or change them completely. The meanies at Koopa's castle wanted her to manipulate Sora's memories enough to make him their puppet, but Axel just had to screw everything up and set her free. She says she can repair everyone's memories if they can make it to the top of the castle. So that's our next destination. Good thing that's on the next floor. Marluxia is said to be the last obstacle in our path. And according to Namine, he was the mastermind behind it all. He made her do all the memory manipulation stuff. Cut to Marluxia at the top of the castle having a bit of a debate with Axel as to whether or not treason is cool. During this, Marluxia tells his grand plan, that they would use Sora to take over the organization. Whatever this organization is, it must be pretty big if it doesn't only have the four that we've seen. Axel wasn't interested in taking it over, but was rather working with it to weed out the traitors. Marluxia being the last one left. The debate gets a bit heated and they have a fight to the death. Marluxia gets in a bit of a pickle and summons Namine as a human shield, I, I guess he can do that. Sora gets word of this, and they get into the room too. This is getting kinda political, guys. Sora says that he's gonna kill the both of them because black coat equal bad. He starts with Axel, rather than the guy who's holding the only person he even knows anymore captive. After he gets his ass beat, Axel fucks off, leaving only Marluxia. He tells Namine to erase Sora's memory, so that he may be rebuilt to be the puppet Marluxia wanted him to be. Namine says she won't, but like the hero he is, Sora tells her to do it, without even really thinking about how that might end up killing everyone he ever knows and loves. I mean, I guess he doesn't know them, but... Marluxia even calls him a dumbass, saying he'll end up being just like the replica of Riku. Speak of the devil, look who's alive! Marluxia rightfully asks how he's even still standing. Replica's response is less than ideal. What can you possibly think I ever had? Both my body and my heart are fake. But 
There is one memory I'll keep, even if it's just a lie. Whether it was a phantom promise or not, I will protect Namine. You see, this is why I prefer the Japanese dubs of these games. On top of being the native language of the developers, there's also less restrictions and censorship on what they can say, which leads to the creative freedom that this series really needs. Marluxia has shown his true colors, and the final battle has begun. Did you know? All the music in the 1.5 re-release of Kingdom Hearts 1 was redone by a real orchestra instead of using midis. In Chain of Memories, the only song that got this treatment was the final boss theme here. And be sure to hit me in my Tarion, where the skull is the thinnest, for maximum damage. This, this is the heart of a hero. So he dies, like, a lot, and that's it. That's the final boss. We get some parting words from the replica. Sora, you're a good guy. I don't have to be real to see how real your feelings are. That's good enough. Riku! Then we get taken to the pod from which our memories will come back. Namine says it'll take a long time to recover all these memories, and that they'll forget everything about their journey in Castle Oblivion. She takes the time to give them a choice. You can lose your memories of this castle, and reclaim your old ones, or keep your memories here, and give up the memories that you- But he's already in the pod. Good night, Sora. So, that's it. One game down for this video. One to go- Psych! You thought we were done with Chain of Memories, you idiot? There's an entire second story mode starring the real Riku, baby. You can never escape! The last we left off with Riku was when him and King Mickey sealed off the door to darkness. Now he seems to be floating around in the void, and King Mickey isn't there. A disembodied voice tells Riku that he's drifted off into a place between light and dark. A card is materialized in front of him, and he's told that he'll be given the ultimate challenge should he take it playing Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. Riku takes the card, and he's transported to a familiar-looking castle. I'll just add right now that this story starts in the middle of Sora's. The card leads to Hollow Bastion, and his journey begins. The gimmick here is that he's going through his memories, rather than redoing them. Riku walks around for a while, but he doesn't end up seeing anyone. The voice chimes in, saying, It's metaphorical of how you cast everyone in your life aside in the pursuit of darkness. That's why no one's here. It's pretty powerful. I'm gonna use it for my English paper. Can you tell me how you feel right now? But it turns out Mr. Voice was full of shit because there's one figment of memory there. Maleficent. Riku's like, okay, I get the point already. I'm gonna be fighting the dark figures that I embraced in the past in an attempt to move on from that, right? And then Maleficent turns into a dragon again. After very easily winning that battle, Voice says, come on, man, the darkness is pretty cool. It'll get you laid, bro. There's this girl in the castle I could hook you up with if you just give into the void. Stop resisting. Accept the darkness. You have no choice. If you are to serve me again. That's not Billy Zane. So, yeah, I guess he was asking too much for reprising his role, or his schedule is filled up. So, Ansem is now voiced by Richard Epcar, more well known for voicing Raiden in Mortal Kombat. This one is more aggressive sounding, but I guess it could be worse. If you're wondering how he's alive, well, that's easy. You see, Ansem was destroyed by Sora and Co., but because he possessed Riku in order to appear in the first place, a piece of him still resides in his heart. But what confuses me is that he's not just an internal voice that Riku hears. He's around outside his body, and other people can see him later on. So, like, why does he even need Riku? Maybe he can appear only within, like, 500 feet of him? Like the opposite of a restraining order. Anyway, Ansem slaps Riku around for a little while, but everyone's favorite little mouse comes in to save the day. That's right, Stuart Little. I'm just goofing around, it's Mickey. He also appears as a little Riku phantom. So, did Mickey die and possess Riku too, or...? 
Well, Ransom fucks off after giving Riku a little bit of non-consensual darkness. Cut to another cutscene with the organization, and this time we're introduced to two new guys along with Vexen. Big one's Lexius, little one's Zexion. All that's really said here is that Zexion senses Riku's presence. Riku's taking a stroll around Castle Oblivion when he suddenly smells something familiar. What's that scent? It's so familiar. <gasps> darkness. It's the smell of darkness. I wonder if it tastes good. Anyway, he smells it because it's coming from him. Mickey shows back up to comfort him, this time being a ghost. Apparently he's sending his power over to the castle to project himself in front of Riku. He says a bunch of, Light's epic, don't give in to the dark, and leaves. Vexen says he likes Riku more than Sora because I mean have you seen those pants? And so he teleports to meet him. All he really says is that his leader is half handsome, half not handsome. So there's a bit of lore for you. And then they fight. Vexen says during the clash, well, well, wait a minute, I've got an idea. BRB, I'm gonna make a clone of you, and teleports away. Lexius and Zexion seem to be the least problematic ones here. They're just chilling in the basement of the castle, not doing anything except coming up with ways to not be involved. I like that. While Riku's looking for a bathroom, the newly created replica appears and picks a fight with the real thing, cause, cause why not? And you know what? I just realized that the replica wields a keyblade. Why didn't they make a clone of Sora instead of trying to manipulate his memories? I mean, Sora fought organization members like 20 times, you'd think that'd be enough data to make a clone. Vexen only needed to fight Riku once, and a clone was fully finished two scenes later. Better yet, just use the Riku replica you already have as a puppet. He already uses darkness, you'd need to teach Sora to use it. I should be a writer for this shit. Anyway, they beat each other up and the replica runs off. Riku chases after him, but gets distracted by Ansem being funny. It's the same spiel, except the darkness. No. Okay, love you, bye. Time to do some more Disney Worlds. In the meantime, Axel, Larxene, and Vexen are having a chat about testing Sora by using the replica, and they decide that they're gonna reset his memory so that he believes he's the real Riku, in order to make it a more authentic experience so they get a good score on Metacritic. Replica speaks up. If I can make an objection to that, I feel the better way to test Sora is if I retain the memories of both the real me and the fake of me that I am right now. That way I can utilize the darkness a bit more liberally, which Sora is used to through fighting the real one back in Halabasta. <laughs> And at the same time, I could express the emotion that the real Riku does. I feel like that would- <laughs> Did this joke land the second time? I don't know. Cut to three minutes later, his memory is reset to the real Riku's. And he says he's gonna protect Namine and kill Sora, yada yada. He leaves and Larxene makes fun of her, calling her the Shadow of Kairi. What could that mean? Lexius and Zexion talk about how the other's plan of control of Sora is stupid because he's a light man. So they come to the conclusion that they need to go after Riku and use him to take down Marluxia. I consider that the smarter move. After Riku completes the last round of Disney Worlds, Lexius is waiting on the other side to take him down. You see, it turns out, Lexius is strong as fuck, and he's giving Riku the ultimatum of embrace the darkness and join us, or die. Riku chooses to die a few times, because this fight's kind of hard. After getting his butt absolutely handed to him, Riku decides, eh, maybe darkness will get me late after all, and then he one-shots Lexius. Inside Riku's heart, Ansem's like, well that was a fucking stupid idea, now I'm gonna eat you up. He starts unhinging his jaw, when once again Mickey comes in clutch. You meddlesome king! Riku wakes up from his darkness binge and continues onward. Axel goes to Zexion and informs him, as well as the audience, that we're at the chronological point where Sora just beat Marluxia. Zexion's like, well, I guess I gotta die next, BRB. He meets up with Riku and tries to fuck with his head, saying that Sora will have to kill him because of the darkness in his heart. And also that Sora's in the castle with him, at the top floor. Riku goes to Destiny Islands, where they have their little battle. And by that, I mean they didn't have enough budget to put in another battle arena, so they had to reuse the same one that Darkseid had. But first, we have to mindfuck Riku a little bit more. So here's an apparition of Sora that tries to kill him. Fake Sora's about to finish Riku off, but then Kairi shows up. It's actually Namine pretending to be Kairi, but don't tell Riku, shh. She says, hey, so here's a thought. Why don't you use the light and the dark? Like, you don't have to give in in order to use the dark. You just gotta find a balance between the two. Honestly, if you do that, you'll be the most powerful character in this stupid-ass series. Riku takes her genuinely good advice and beats the apparition. Now the true battle can begin. You reek of darkness. Even the light can't block the smell. 
Yeah, Zexion, you're really not cut out for the organization. Maybe competitive Smash is more up your alley? Now that Riku has definitively figured out that the darkness will, in fact, get him laid, this fight becomes easy for him. Before Zexion bites the dust, he escapes back to the basement so he can get a little better with Greninja before taking on Riku again. But waiting for him there is Axel and the Replica. Keep in mind, this is now after the end of Sora's story, so the Replica knows he's fake and wants to forge his own personality. Axel says, A good start to have your own identity is to kill Zexion here, lol. And I guess because the Replica was literally born today, he does it. Apparently the reason why he had Zexion killed was because he knew way too much. Honestly, I forgot what that means, so I'm gonna move on now. Riku's making his way up when Ansem comes back to be annoying. The more Riku uses the darkness, the more control Ansem gets. So he freezes him up and is about to assume control over his body. For the 20th time, Mickey comes in clutch. Must you interfere again? We'll be back with more of this fucking horseshit after this commercial break. Only on Disney Channel. But wow! Mickey's here for real this time. Finally. But I guess that doesn't matter because as soon as they enter Twilight Town, Mickey just disappears, leaving Riku to fight Ansem. But hold on. Riku puts his keyblade down. It's not the real Ansem. He smells different, of course. Yes, as it turns out, this one's a fake. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Diz. He tells Riku to go to Namine, and from there, all will become clear. Riku goes to the mansion to find her when he's stopped by the replica. Because I'm you. No, I'm me. I'm me, he says. He starts having a mental breakdown, talking about how he's fake, and he'll never be anything but that. The only way for him to be anything more than a shadow is if the real one dies. So the battle begins once again. And once it does begin, I notice that they're in the complete opposite positions that they were in the cutscene. The battle is won and it's time for the replica to go. Poor guy. Riku goes into the mansion to find Namine and finds her, along with Sora. Namine explains everything so I don't have to. He's then given a choice of his own. That choice being whether to get into a pot of his own and forget all memories of Ansem and Darkness so that he could be rid of Darkness, or not doing that. Figures. Sora always did as he pleased. Whatever we'd be doing together, He'd find a way to slack off. Even trying to leave the islands. I did all the work on the raft by myself. That's it. When this slacker wakes up, I'll tell him off. I told him to take care of Kyrie, and here he is just taking a nap. But I can't chew him out like he deserves, if I've been asleep. He ends up choosing to stay awake and fight Ansem himself. He also says that he knew it was Namine at Destiny Islands and not Kyrie. When did you know? I knew when I met you. You and Kyrie smell the same. He meets with Mickey and Diz back at the castle. Diz gives Riku an organization coat. Apparently it wards off darkness, so that's pretty useful. But now it's time for the final battle. But I do need... a favor. If Ansem is the victor, he is going to enslave me. If that happens, use your powers... to destroy- Of course! I'll be right there to save ya! Huh? No, th that's not it. I want you to destroy- No way! No matter what ha Please kill me. I smell you, Ansem. <laughs> Who writes this shit? Why do you accept the darkness, but still refuse me? Why would you break up with me and date Brad? He's way worse. You know you and I are similar. We both follow where the darkness leads. Indeed, we are the same. So why? He's making it sound like everyone who has darkness in their hearts are friends. So the fight begins, and there's really nothing to say about it, so Riku wins. Why do you refuse the darkness? Ansem says he'll never be fully extinguished, and will return one day, and then he disappears. Riku and Mickey walk out of the castle with the black coats on, and 
I wish I still had the soul to laugh at this. And that, finally, is the end of Chain of Memories. F fuck, I completely forgot I have to go over another one. Okay, so this game came out four years after Kingdom Hearts 2, but to me and a lot of others, it feels like it should be played before 2. It was released in 2009 on the DS, where it received fairly positive reviews, but not by the fans. A lot of people seem to have hated its gameplay style. I played this game a few years ago, and from what I remember, it was alright. Not great, but not bad. I had a more painful experience with Chain of Memories. The game never got a remake, but the cutscenes were remastered along with it getting some new ones. So think of this more as a movie. So, our story starts with a boy waking up in front of that mansion from the last game. A man in a black coat appears in front of him and says the following. Note, he doesn't actually say any of this, it's just that I need to explain some stuff that Kingdom Hearts 2 did and assumes you already knew going in. Listen up, baby boy, you belong to me now. You know what you are? You're a nobody. Everyone at the organization is. A nobody, in case you're wondering, is the husk of a person left behind when it becomes a heartless. Nobodies with strong wills, however, retain their bodies and sentience. You are someone's nobody. Everyone at the organization has a fun little gimmick in their name that I came up with. We rearrange the letters of the original somebody's name and put an X in it. For instance, my good friend Lorax. If Arlo found out I was hanging out with his nobody again, he'd kill me. As for you, your somebody's name was... Sora. So we're gonna rearrange that so it says Oras, which of course stands for Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. No, no, actually, swap the R and the O. I got it. Roxas. Welcome to Organization 13, Roxas. Pretty bad timing, as they just got another new member right after that, making 14 members of Organization 13. They're not gonna change the name, though. They'll die on the 13th hill. Some of these members are quite the characters. Good thing I got Jiminy's journal right here, so I can give you the skinny on them. Syax. He carries around the screams of his family. And a mean right hook. Axel. Fire. Uh-oh. Ouch, ouch, hot, hot, hot. Demix. Doesn't believe in vaccines or women, only the flow of the beat. Vexian. This guy could really use a shower, I could smell him from here. Zigbar. I I'd be careful of this one. He doesn't really look like someone you want to have your back turned to. Luxord, or Luxord. A gambler. Keep him away from me, I already lost my house and my family to the cards. Roxas has only just joined, and our newest member is named Shion. Neither of them talk much because they're both mentally babies. I mean that literally. Axel's trying to get Roxas to loosen up a bit by taking him to the top of a very tall building and sitting on the edge eating ice cream. It seems they need Roxas as a member because he can wield a Keyblade. They, for some reason, need the Keyblade to be used to kill Heartless. Any other weapon does the job, but it's no good for their greater goals. So Roxas is doing missions for a long time, all of them being about killing Heartless, and always eating ice cream with Axel after. After about 20 days, Axel says he's not going to be able to do ice cream related shit for a while, because him and some other members are going to be heading to a castle. Sound familiar? Yeah, so this game starts before the events of Chain of Memories. Sora's still chasing after Riku and Mickey at this point. In case you might be wondering how Sora has a nobody, it's because of when he stabbed himself and became a heartless at Hollow Bastion. Worst bachelor party I've ever been to. At this point, Axel's told by Syax that there's traitors among the gang going to Castle Oblivion. In Axel's absence, they're now having Roxas go on missions with Shion. Which is, which is just a great idea, having the two least experienced people in the organization go on missions together. During these missions, some important dialogue comes out. R Roxas. Huh? Shion? Roxas is your name. Yeah. Eventually, they both figure out that Shion can also use the Keyblade, and she one-shot Darkseid. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you earned the icing on the cake. Huh? Come on, I'll show you. Roxas, don't do it, man. No, 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 no. So he takes her to the scary tall building to eat ice cream. And it's here that I noticed that they're just biting into the ice cream right out of the package. So I'm ending the video here. Goodbye. Did they leave? <laughs> Finally, I'm alone. Now for the icing on the cake. So Axel shows back up like 50 days later. I'm pretty sure the events of Chain of Memories were like one day. 
They eat ice cream together. Once he reports back to the organization, he reports that Namine has gone missing and he doesn't know how. We all know it was because of him, but don't tell Xehanort. Syax basically implies that he sent everyone that he wanted dead to Castle Oblivion. So, you know, he's a dingus. Roxas, Axel, and Shion go on a mission together and it goes really good. After the intense battle, they go to the usual spot for some more ice cream. Axel says that all the nobodies from the organization remember their lives when they were human, but Roxas and Shion don't have memories. Syax comes back for more and tells Axel he needs to go back to Castle Oblivion to uncover all of its secrets. And then he says that the castle is where Shion was born. He then further elaborates on how he basically facilitated all the other members at the castle to be killed. There's a weird tension going on between the two of them, as if they had some sort of past. Okay, so I'm going through this plot kind of fast, and it's all over the place thus far, because the nature of the plot is very repetitive. Almost every single day ends with a cutscene of them talking while eating ice cream. Every time they meet up, they say, I knew you'd be here, like no shit. They talk about how friendship is pretty rad, the next day the same thing happens. It's really every 10 days or so that something plot important happens, and it's given to you in pretty short cutscenes. This kind of formula works pretty well with a DS game, but translate that into a near 3 hour movie and it's painful. Cut to a few days later and Shion's sulking in her room about a flashback that she had about a fight with a white haired man and hey, it's Riku, wearing a blindfold. What was that about? Anyway, he beat her up and said her Keyblade was a sham. Why? You're the real sham! <sighs> Fair enough. You could say I am the biggest nobody of them all. This ended up messing with her enough that she failed a mission and went into a coma. Whoops. Syax is being a ding-dong about it and did you know? Syax is voiced by the voice actor for Shadow the Hedgehog. See, I'm getting really bored here. About 20 days later, she awakens from her coma after having a dream about the events of Kingdom Hearts 1. Skip a few thousand days and Axel is finally sent back to Castle Oblivion. Seems like Shion's getting curious about where she came from, so she was snooping around research files scattered around home base. This ends up leading her to Castle Oblivion as well. She tries to get in further, but Axel stops her. She describes that she's been having dreams of her past involving Hollow Bastion and this castle and even Axel. I wonder why. Axel tries to stop her from going forward, but she moves on anyway. And then, before we could see the truth, we cut back to the usual spot with Roxas eating ice cream with Axel. Roxas wondering where she went. A few decades later, a scene with Riku and Namine plays, where he asks how Sora's doing. She says that there are crucial parts of his memory that are missing. It's Shion that's causing this. You see, Shion has been absorbing Sora's memories, not on purpose, but because they're linked. Shion is Sora's memories of Kairi incarnate. She's comprised of a few snippets of Sora's memory that Namine gathered back during the events of Chain of Memories, all of which related to Kairi, which is why she kind of looks like her, but goth. She takes on a human form because she's a replica, like the Riku replica. The reason she was created by the organization at all was as a backup plan just in case something went wrong with Roxas. The problem with her existence now is that those memories that she carries are not in Sora and cannot be in Sora unless she's taken out. And on top of that, they also kind of need Roxas to not be in the picture because he's also required for Sora to come back. You see, when uh, one of those nobodies that has a strong will, so has a body of their own like the organization, dies, they go back to being the way that they were before. They go back to being human. Are you following me thus far? Listen, just the main point that I want you to take here is start counting how many Soras there are, because we're at three. That's pretty low. Other main point being the organization really, really wants Sora. They want a Sora, they want a Keyblade, therefore they want Sora. They are willing to create him if they can't have him. Currently, at the moment, things are going pretty good for the organization. Because with Shion and Roxas around, they have two Keyblades for whatever their greater goal may be. And also, on top of that, with them around, Sora cannot wake up. AKA, their biggest threat is out of the picture. But they're starting to encounter a snag in the road. You see, both Roxas and Shion have been trying to be their own people instead of just being continuations of their human counterpart. If they become their own people instead of the mindless puppets that they wanted them to be, that's no good. They'll start forming their own opinions. 
so it's likely that soon, the organization will destroy one, if not both of them. This would bring Sora back, which, unfortunately, that's what Diz wants. He wants Sora back on the ground badly. The motivation, we don't know yet. And he's the one in charge of the Sora revival project, so the only real outcome of this situation is that Roxas and Shion become a part of Sora again, aka they cease to exist. I'm aware that, that was a very sudden info dump, but that's how they treated it in this fucking movie. Even if you had played Kingdom Hearts 2 at this point, you would not be able to comprehend all of this. It's a disaster. So much so that I'm not reading off of a script right now. All of what I've been doing has been off a script. Right now, it's off script because I did not want to waste my time in typing all of it. Diz enlists his trusty assassin, Riku, to take them out himself. Riku is now apparently willing to kill for Sora, so I guess add him to the list of people obsessed with him. Or maybe he just solidified his place there. Roxas eventually catches on that Shion might be a Castle Oblivion, and Axel's like, ah, fuck it, let's go. So they go to look for her there. However, Roxas gets a bad headache and didn't bring any aspirin, so they retreat for now. They end up back in town, where they see... Shion. What a coincidence. But she walks off and a hooded man blocks the path, before also walking away. Turns out the hooded guy is Riku. He's not going the route of killing her, no, he's more dignified than that. He's just gonna coerce her into killing herself by showing her she has nothing left. And they say Chivalry's dead. After giving chase a while longer, Roxas finally catches up with Shion and asks her to come back. She says no and starts walking away. Roxas grabs her arm in desperation, so she busts out the Keyblade. Axel wasn't having any of that though and knocks her out from behind. She's taken back to home base, but Roxas wasn't happy with the way Axel went about it. And now they aren't currently on speaking terms, so please don't try to invite them both to a party or it'll just be awkward. It seems like they're forming into too much of their own people because Sora's now at risk of never waking up if something doesn't stop them. It's here that we see Diz is kinda racist against nobodies. Nobody's never should have existed. As I'm sure you understand, Namine. Yes. At this point, the organization really needs one of them dead, so they sent Shion on a suicide mission to fight Zigbar over here. He says something really weird. Of all the faces, why do I look at her and see yours? Why is it? that you always have to glare at me like that. SHUT UP! That looks like Roxas, but what's with that armor piece on his shoulder? Anyway, she beats him and tries to convince Axel to let her go. He says no at first, but then she shows him her face, and he changes his mind because that bitch hideous. The organization wants her captured again so they could properly eliminate her, I think. Axel's hired to do the job. He stalls for a few days, while Roxas has some time to think about stuff. Stuff like, what exactly is Shion anyway, and what is the organization keeping from me about her, and what is the organization keeping from me about me? This ends up getting to Roxas, and he leaves to find some answers. Syax tries to stop him, but fuck that guy, am I right, fellas? Roxas makes it out of home base, where Axel's waiting for him. He tries to stop him verbally, but also fails. Meanwhile, Shion's chatting with Namine. Namine tells her, if you disappear, you won't be remembered, because you yourself are a memory. That's logic, I think. Shion had her headphones in, so she didn't really catch that, but she agrees. But hold your horses. Axel's here, and he's pissed. They're gonna have one last battle for all the money. And, and, and then it cuts to Axel carrying her back to home base. So I guess he won. Shall we cut to the next day? Only two more to go. Roxas is hanging out at the usual spot, because where did he think he was going? But then Shion comes in, hooded. They share one last ice cream together. How sweet. Yet... Salty, but good things can't last forever. She stands up and takes off her hood. Roxas? Hey, I know that guy. Looks like Roxas has to become a part of Sora too, so it's fight night tonight, boys. This fight's actually pretty cool. She takes you around all the different Disney worlds I haven't even talked about, and then it ends with her becoming a big ass robot thingy while one of the better songs in the series plays, Vector to the Heavens. But, after a slash here, and a slash there, she's toast. She asks Roxas to take all the hearts she's taken from the Heartless free. That was a tongue twister. And then she crystallizes into nothingness. I am going to cry. But just like everyone else in this game now... Who was I just talking about? R Roxas, right? Let's move on and see what happens to him.
Roxas is walking through downtown New York, seeing if he can maybe mug some poor fool. They never suspect the nobodies. Suddenly, he's surrounded by Heartless. Looks like he's the one getting mugged. But don't worry, it seems the memories of Shion were weighing him down because now he has TWO Keyblades, baby! Riku watches that all go down, but little did Roxas know he was the leader of that gang of Heartless, so now he's out for blood. So now for the question that the fans have been asking for years. Who would win in a fight? Riku or Roxas? Surprisingly enough, it would be Roxas. If Riku wasn't a cheating little bitch. He takes off his blindfold and becomes Ansem. What a sore loser, if he can't win, nobody does. Anyway, he knocks Roxas out cold after that. This shows up to claim the bounty and drag him back to his secret lab. Once they arrive, Diz uses his technological prowess to transport Roxas... somewhere. We don't know yet. When Riku asks where Roxas was sent, Diz responds... Well... <laughs> Interestingly.